New Year, same unhealthy coping mechanisms. Hi, I'm Alex, I'm 18, I read way too much YA, and I read 56 books in the month of January this year, so let's talk about them a little bit. Um, if you're new to these videos, I'm not going to talk about all 56 in this video, just because that would take way too long. So we're going to start by going over like statistics and stuff surrounding what I read, um, then we're going to talk about the five runners up to my top five, so the 10th to 6th best book I read. Then we're going to go into alternating between the five worst and the five best books that I read this year. I understand that stats are not everyone's jam, so I do put a link in the description to when I start like talking about the books. Um, and if you wanted to see me talk about the other 41 books I read this month, I'll do that if this video gets to like 30 likes, because that's a lot of work. <laughs> Okay, so on screen right now, there should be a graph of the distributions of everything I read so far this year. Um, and for the most part, the distributions are pretty standard for me. I normally read about like 50% of what I read is normally contemporary or fantasy. Um, contemporary was a little bit ahead of fantasy like it normally is. And on the low end, I only read one science fiction book and one paranormal book this month. Paranormal is a bit harder to categorize because sometimes paranormal is in fantasy and sometimes it's in paranormal. I go off of the top tags on Goodreads, so I guess only one of them had paranormal as a top tag on Goodreads. Um, I also only read two dystopia and two nonfiction books. And then I read six graphic novels, which is good because one of my like things last year was I wanted to read more graphic novels. I do think those are mostly just Lumberjanes books though because I read one Lumberjanes volume a week. So I either read four or five Lumberjanes volumes over the course of January, but apparently I read another graphic novel. I can't for the life of me remember what it was. Um, and I also read eight mystery thrillers, which does not bode well once we move into our next chart. So this next graph has the average ratings. I gave everything that I've read so far this year. I read out of 17, which is why the numbers look weird and like go up to 15. They do make sense. There's not 17 criteria points. It's just like a random number I chose one day and I'm stuck with it, but everything should line up because I have a big list that I slot everything into. Um, my average overall rating this month was 10.3, which is like substantially better than my average ratings. Not substantially. I did have 10.3 once before, but normally it tends to be like between 9.8 and 10.1. So starting off the year with a bang, which was really fun. Although I didn't read a lot of excellent books. I just read, I didn't read as many average books as normally. I read like a lot of slightly above average books, which is I think where that number comes from. This month I had three different genres tie with my average. So dystopia, graphic novels, and historical fiction all have the same average rating as my overall average rating. So they were neither above nor below average this month. So that means that below average we have fantasy, mystery, thriller, and paranormal. Paranormal looks significantly below the average. But like remember, I only read one paranormal book and I gave it a 5.5, which is why that's so low. It was my worst book of the year so far. So we'll get to that when we are talking about the actual books. So I would say that like Actually, my lowest genre was probably the eight mystery thriller books I read this year, which was also significantly lower than normal, which is not fun because it was my third most read genre so far. I think almost my entire, except for that one paranormal book, lowest book list is mystery thriller books that I was just not impressed with. And everything else would be above my average with nonfiction being at the top, but again, I only read two nonfiction books. It actually means that contemporary is near the top this month with a rating of 10.3 on average, which is a whole thing above my overall average, which is really fun because normally either contemporary or fantasy is like significantly below my average. Fantasy is a little below my average this month, but just because of the way things work out, those being the genres I read the most are gonna have like a huge influence on the overall rating. So it was really fun that it was that high above. I read 18,013 pages this month, which averages out to 581-ish a day. I also, because I want to be a more productive person in 2021, I'm going to try like at this section of the videos to talk about another goal in my life. My current goal is I am writing by hand a manuscript right now, which is was not a good idea, but it is my, one of my problems with writing is I get like very in my head about how long a book should be and how long every chapter should be. So it was really fun to like, here, wait, here, here it is so far to just be able to like, oh my God, a uh, paper flip fell. Yeah, this, it looks very small. It's actually like 80 pages, I think, like of paper, not of actual book pages. Um, and I totally went against my own thing. So I was like, this is so helpful because I don't know how many words I'm writing. And then last night I couldn't sleep because I'm an insomniac and I counted all of the words and there's like 23,000. 
I really couldn't sleep last night. So yeah, my goal for next time is to hopefully have finished writing out the hard copy so I can transfer it to my computer. Um, hopefully we get that done. I think I'm over like a third of the way done right now, just based on where we are in the plot. So it should be kind of achievable because I have a reading week this month, which means I don't have school for a whole week, which is fun. And I also am a volunteer tutor four nights of the week. Uh, and that is also canceled during my reading week. So like we have lots of time that I have no use for So I'll probably either read an insane amount or I'll write an insane amount. Getting into actually talking about books and stuff We're gonna briefly talk about my five runners up to my top five So that's my 10th to 6th best reads this year And then we're gonna move into talking about the actual top five and bottom five Actually, that was a lie because one of the books in my top 10 Because I gave it a 14.5 which means it should be somewhere in my top five is this one my childhood in a box by louise long um and the problem is like like i talk to authors and publishers a lot when they're sending ebooks and i can still give like an impartial opinion i know the editor like i have known the editor since i was a baby so i am extremely biased so while i really enjoyed it and i think it was well done I don't really feel right being like, this was better than all the other books I read, and you should read it too, and it'll have that same impact for you, because obviously reading an autobiography of someone you know is going to be more impactful than it would be for people who don't know them. But yeah, this one is a pretty, it's a pretty cool book. Uh, to talk about it briefly now, so I don't have to put it in the top 10, it's an autobiography, which I think I said, um, slash memoir, I would consider it more of a memoir that was published posthumously of this woman kind of reflecting on her coming of age mostly when she was very young which i think the narration part was done really well because it's very like descriptive narration which is how i talked in my head when i was young and i still talk in my head now but i'm better at not talking vocally after after the end of world war ii all i think i could be wrong i don't know a lot about history what i garnered from the book was that all of the like Italian people, so people who were visibly Italians, were kicked out of Yugoslavian territories and had to go to like kind of refugee camps. I don't remember, I don't think they're called refugee camps. Anyways, very good, but again, I'm very biased. Okay, so then moving into I guess the top nine. The ninth best book I read was Shame is an Ocean I Swim Across by Mary Lambert who I didn't actually realize it was by Mary Lambert before reading it. And I looked at the cover and I was like, holy crap, love her music. What an absolute icon. And yeah, like I think I am a fan of her music and her lyrics. So it was kind of natural that I would also be a fan of her as a poet. Um, her poetry book is told in multiple mediums, some of which are more just like memoir, like short memoir style instead of being like what you could traditionally consider poetry surrounding um, body image, mental health, and assault and like surviving from assaults. Um, it was really well done. I really enjoyed it and I enjoy everything that Mary Lambert does. The eighth best book I read, I also own, I never own this many books that I read, but I bought a bunch at the end of the year last year, um, was Lovely War, which in my opinion very much lives up to the hype, especially because I personally was very, very hesitant to read this because I'll say, I've said in a lot of videos, that I normally claim historical fiction is not my genre. That's an absolute lie. So historical romance, however, is definitely not my genre just because I am not straight and I feel like straight historical romance tends to be straighter than contemporary historical romance because at least with contemporary historical romance you can like relate to things but straight historical romance very much tends to be based around like gendered social rules and stuff like that which isn't something that I can really relate to as a queer woman. Um, yeah, I'm saying that like I didn't love Richardson. Richardson was great, but Eloise is a lesbian and in love with Penn. And I, I'm mad about it. Anyways, um, Lovely War was wonderful. I loved it, even though I'm definitely not the target demographic. And I think the reason I loved it so much is it's framed, if you somehow haven't heard about it, as if the gods, mostly Aphrodite, are telling the love story of these two couples to the other gods. So it's very lyrical and beautiful. And even though the characters, minus one big thing that happens, are pretty like mundane, like they're living through the war, but they're living through the war as pretty average people. I forget what I was saying. I was trying to say that even though the characters are like very average and normal, the book is just filled with so much life and like magic that it makes everything feel that much more emotional and I loved it so much. At seven, we have another book I own. I think this is the last book I own on the list. 
At 7 we have The Ladies Guide to Petticoats and Piracy, which I really really loved. I've been getting recommended this book a lot, mainly from the same handful of people. So like I appreciate it. There's like three people who recommend this to me on repeat and I'm so glad I finally read it. Um, I absolutely adored this. I feel like I said that exact statement with another book, but it's true. I did absolutely adore it. Um, it follows, it's a sequel to The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue, which I did like, but I didn't like anywhere near as much as I liked this one. I, I really like how our protagonist, Felicity, is like flawed. She is so flawed. She starts with the book very like, I'm not like other girls heroine, but actually gets called out on that. And I really like that Lee, instead of just saying like, this is a feminist character, was able to show how she was feminist, but she was also kind of hindered in the way she interacted with other women because of that feminism and because of what she perceived to be the proper way to be like a strong independent woman and the way that she thought everyone else should be and that like she's called out on that, that you can be fighting the good fight and still be wrong about it. And then she actually grows from it and it was wonderful. Lee's a very comical writer with this series so that was also really fun. And yeah, I just, I really, one of my like biggest things that I'm realizing recently is the way women are handled in fiction. You kind of have to either be like a pick me or not like other girl, or you have to be a, a badass heroine. And I really like that this book kind of shows how you can be a badass heroine and also kind of be a little bit of a pick me and kind of need to be like called out on that. So that was really fun. Um, the protagonist is also, I don't know if they say, I don't think they would say it cause I don't think they would have a term for it. Um, she's either a race or just ace does not like either gender, which is like a journey she goes on throughout the book, which was really cool. And I liked it because that's something you don't really get to see a lot in historical fiction either, which is maybe why I liked it. Because again, I'm not a fan of straight historical fiction. Oh my goodness, I also own this one. Wow. Okay, the sixth best book I read was Girl Boy C, which I didn't have. I had the other three on here. This one was just sitting in front of me, so I have piles of books all over my house. Um, Girl Boy C is, I think, middle grade. But it would be kind of like spooky middle grade if you're the lower end of middle grade because they're like shipwrecked and trying to survive sharks and stuff. Anyways, it's very fun. I was really concerned because this was the one I bought a bunch at a time. This was the one that I was like the least invested in when I bought it. And the first few chapters of this book like did not really work for me. I wasn't really captivated by the story. I was like, oh, it's it's a survival story which sometimes i love survival stories i read aftershocks last year and that was really good most of the time i'm not a big fan of survival stories but it's also a survival story about the way that like mentally you survive things and it's a lot of this boy who is shipwrecked and he's wandering around looking for food just trying to figure out how to stay alive and this mysterious girl who has this mysterious past and speaks this other language just shows up and they start working together and she knows all these stories that she's telling him but the one story he wants to find out is hers so you're also in this mystery of who is this girl and what's really going on because a lot of things seem really really shady and i really like the how the reveal of what was going on is handled at the end of the book. Uh, I really liked it. It was very unique and I like books that like make me have to think the whole time, which and not to say that middle grade books can't do that. Some of my favorite books are middle grade books that do that, but isn't as standard in middle grade as it is with older genres. So yeah, loved this. Also, the cover is so pretty. Okay, now we're gonna get into the five best and the five worst books I've read this month. The fifth worst book I read this month was The Murder Game, which I feel kind of guilty about because a lot of my issues with The Murder Game come down to marketing and the author, I got a review copy. I feel really bad because normally a lot of things in like my top books are review copies. I think because I bought so many books that I was so highly anticipating, a lot like you saw, a lot of books that I own and bought recently are in my top 10, which means there wasn't space. I don't know if there's any arcs there. There's a lot of arcs in my bottom five, so I'm very sorry. Please keep sending me arcs. I promise I love them sometimes. And if I like an arc, I'm more likely to talk about it a lot more than other books just because I'm like, not enough people know about this yet. Anyways, The Murder Game, the author, because I posted my review and at the time I felt okay about it because a lot of the reviews were like five stars but I didn't realize that they were all from like newer Goodreads accounts which means that 
not like this is gonna sound like boasting it's not i got like four likes on the review but because of that since all the other reviews from newer accounts it boosted to the top so now the top review is like very very negative hi i'm editing i just checked it's no longer the top review so now the top review is positive again and i don't have to feel guilty um so the author responded uh, to let me know that she also agreed that the marketing was not what she had intended and she didn't like she doesn't like the marketing either but that doesn't erase the fact that the marketing for this book was so poorly handled like look at the cover over there because what i get from this cover is that it's going to be like it's a boarding school murder mystery right we have the 13 tally marks so you're like there's either 13 victims or at least 13 victims or at least 13 suspects one of those and it's gonna be hold on let me read you the description what if your best friend and roommate killed a teacher at your prep school or what if he didn't do it but he's being framed and you're the only person who can save him luke chase didn't mean to get caught up solving the mystery of miss heckler's murder he just wanted to spend alone time with a new british girl at their boarding school but little did he know someone would end up dead right next to the rendezvous spot in the woods and his best friend and roommate Oscar Waymouth would be the one to take the blame. With suspects aplenty and a past that's anything but innocent, Luke Chase reluctantly calls on his famous survival skills to solve the mystery and find the true killer. Which to me, based on that, like with the title, is there's some kind of like secret society that Luke has to try to infiltrate that is framing his roommate that is participating in this murder game. And maybe it's gonna be him he has to pass off as like he's also a murderer, so he's gonna be part of the murder game. But that there's not a game. I don't know, wait, let me see what the author said, because she did explain why they call it a game. She said her original title idea was sneaking out, um, she, that she also asked the editor about the cover and title because she didn't think they had anything to do with the book either, and the editor said that they thought that the murderer was toying with people, and that's why they said game. So it's not, it's not an actual game, the title was just chosen because the author thinks the murderers, which I don't think they're even really toying with people that like a little, but not more, it's not like a jigsaw type thing, you know? And then she said that the pencils and paper are just meant to like represent the fact that they're at school, it's not that it's actually like a school club or anything, and the number there, I'm pretty sure she didn't mention it. I'm pretty sure it's redundant. I saw another review suggesting that maybe they didn't count. They think they, there could be around 13 suspects, but that's not something the plot's not like, there was 13 suspects, so I really, I just don't understand what the book is actually about, which I didn't even say, which I probably should have said before saying all that. It's basically just this guy and his roommate and two girls are like cooking up in the woods and a teacher is murdered nearby and you think they might have witnessed it and then the friend is accused and then he's like, I have to solve the murder, which yes, still technically kind of fits the description, but the description when paired with the title makes you think there's like a big sinister overarching plot going on, which there just isn't. And I don't know, because of marketing, like I, I was a little mad just as a reviewer because I was excited to read this book about some like murder society. And if I had paid money for it, I feel like I would feel very, very gypped by this book. So well, it's like just a slightly, in my opinion, just because I didn't really like the narration below average prep school murder mystery that's not what was sold to me so that's why i rated it so low okay the fifth best book i read was black girl unlimited which is kind of i think it's either autobiographical or semi-autobiographical it's such a very it's a very raw read it uses magic realism to talk about the trauma that our main character Echo is going through in the ways that she tries to cope with that trauma by turning it into like this magical mystical thing uh it's a lot just fear more like you have to be in a very good headspace to read this um it's also like away from subject matter um told in this kind of linear yet non-linear style that really really works like we start off flashing back between something traumatic that happens in the protagonist's life and then like her memories and then we move from there i really loved that style of storytelling i think it suited this book very well okay the fourth worst book i read was also a murder mystery arc i got which is why mystery thriller is so low down um so the perfect place to die is genuinely i think the author would be very good at writing cozy mysteries um like cozy mysteries targeted at adults but this book like first off it's the story of a 17 year old 
who at no point sounds 17. She reads, and I know we say like, oh, it sounds like a fake 17 year old, but no, they don't even try to make her sound like a fake 17 year old. She sounds like a jaded 30 year old the whole book. And they only mention her being 17 a handful of times. And every time they did it, I fully convinced myself that I just imagined them saying she was 17. Like I had to go through and like screenshots so I could put them next to each other because I read it digitally all the pages where it mentioned that she's 17 because I kept thinking I imagined it and it's like there's no way this person's a teenager. So on that angle, not well done. The narration didn't really fit with who our main character is supposed to be. However, if this book had an older protagonist, I don't think I would have had any issues with the narration. My issue comes down to the plot because The Perfect Place to Die is a fictional story of our 17-year-old protagonist who's trying to thwart the actual H.H. H. Holmes. If the name H.H. H. Holmes sounds familiar but you can't tell where from, he's the guy that had the big murder castle real historical serial killer. Um, but the problem is this book tells you in the description that he is a real historical serial killer and it, they literally they don't change his name. He shows up and he's like, I'm Henry Holmes or I think his first name is Henry. I'm Henry Holmes, hi. But they still try to do the thing where, you know how like with Scooby-Doo villains, they act like they're helpful and then they're actually like a twist villain. They try to use that. And the whole plot is kind of built around like the way you would frame a mystery book if the you wanted the audience to be sticking around to find out who the murderer is but it literally told us it was a story of hh holmes and then was like this is hh holmes and like i don't understand why the narrative was set up that way i get if you wanted to like use hh H. holmes to tell a fictional story that's fine but it was it wasn't a fictional story it was a fictional mystery where everyone involved already knew who the twist villain was going to be. The fourth last book I read was Dear Justice by Nick Stone, who is an insanely talented writer. Love her so much. Dear Justice is the sequel to Dear Martin, but Dear Martin can be read as a standalone because I think Dear Justice came about. Um, Nick actually talks about in the beginning of the book how it was like teenagers, I think, that she'd met in the past, reached out to her and kind of gave her the idea for the story post Dear Martin, which is where this one comes from. Like in Dear Martin, Dear Justice tells the story in such a moving yet informative style and it's also very compact, which I think is one of the most wonderful things about Nick Stone's work because it deals with a lot of like heavy subject matter and that yes, other books have tackled and other books will continue to tackle, but Nick tells it in such an easily consumable way that is easily accessible to a lot of people from different educational backgrounds, different just like the amount of time you have to invest in a book because that's also like books are not the most accessible way of hearing stories and I think Nick takes something that could have been like this huge like 500 page book and makes it very compact without losing any of the emotional impact which is such an insanely difficult thing to do. The third verse book I read was also a mystery thriller but it was none arc. It was The Cousins by Karen and McManus. Here is my controversial opinion. Karen and McManus wrote one good mystery thriller and the reason one of us was lying, which is like up on my bookshelf, a friend gave it to me. I don't think she watches these, but thank you friend who gave it to me. The reason one of us is lying is a good mystery thriller, despite the fact that the plot twist is not a good plot twist, is because of the fact that you don't know it's going to have a ludicrous plot twist. So you're reading it, trying to like hold on to the clues and stuff. And then every book she's done past that, you're expecting a ludicrous 11th hour plot twist, which means that you're no longer invested in trying to figure out like, where are all the clues for this mystery? Because you know it's gonna be like one big in your face thing that you don't get the last piece for until the end, because that's always what it is and that you shouldn't even read into any of the other leads, uh, which is what The Cousins is. <laughs> it's, but this one I think is the worst Karen and McManus book I've read so far. Like she's not a bad author, but my opinion is she shouldn't be writing mystery thriller. She should be writing contemporary because it seems like even her books, they're focused more on the contemporary things. And it's kind of like, oh, there's also a mystery happening. Like I genuinely, I know, I couldn't tell what the big mystery element was going. Like obviously it was like, why are they on this island? But the mystery thing didn't even seem important until about halfway through the books. Up until then, I'm like, why am I reading about these spoiled rich kids being annoying? And that's the other problem with this one. Karen and McManus books, you read because her characters are normally like they're character driven stories. They're mysteries that aren't plot driven, which is I think why it appeals to audiences that don't generally read mysteries. Uh, but every character in this was just so unlikable, which was so weird because she can write 
very distinct. You can like debate whether or not they're likable, well, but she can write distinct perspective characters. We know that from her other books, but they all sounded the same. They were all whiny. I kept forgetting who was talking. It was not a good time. And the other, 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 I keep saying other, other, other thing here is like I said, I didn't really even like have any stake in the mystery until halfway through, maybe even more than halfway through. And that's because most of her previous works, especially like One of Us is Lying, start off with this big inciting incident that makes you invested in figuring out what happened. And here our inciting incident is just that these kids get letters to go to this island and they're like, we don't want to go see our grandma and work on the island. Like, which is okay, but this is a murder mystery. and. Why didn't we start with something that made me be like, I wonder who the murderer is? Because I just, like, the mystery element came way too late here, which meant that you had to spend so much time just with these unlikable characters and you didn't care what was going on. And it just, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a good time. Okay, the third best book I read was Grown by Tiffany D. Jackson. I love Tiffany D. Jackson so much. I think she's one of the authors who I've because I read, there was a point in time where I'd read multiple Tiffany D. Jackson books without realizing that they were all by the same author. And because I get worried if I love multi like a bunch of books by an author that I just loved one thing and that's brushing off on everything else they've written. But it's not because I read Allegedly back when it came out and it was one of my favorite things for like a whole year. And then when I started reading other books, I was like, these are all also so great. And then I found out they were the same woman. She's so great. Um, but like the rest of her books, Grown deals with like an insane amount of trauma. The character is going through a lot. So fair warning there. Um, Grown specifically follows a 17 year old Enchanted after getting discovered by a music star leads to her eventually waking up in a bathroom covered in what she calls beet juice, which implications surrounding beet juice, probably not beet juice. Jackson's teenage voice is always so great, which makes it more harrowing to see um, Enchanted fall down this kind of like rabbit hole of being manipulated by some very bad people in positions of power. This book is harrowing, but it's also very important. Okay, the second worst book I read was Willow's Adventure. Okay, this is another one I got an arc for. Um, I think this was self-published just based on the number of spelling and grammar errors and stuff in it. Now I feel guilty about giving self-published books bad readings but they're still books and i don't think it's fair to say like they're immune to criticism because if i read a good self-published book i'd be like this was a great book i wouldn't say this is a great self-published book uh so let's talk about it stylistically this just isn't the book that i tend to enjoy the author is the kind of person who uses all caps to not even just for characters yelling just to like emphasize things where other characters would use italics and snooty authors still would say don't use italics that's bad. Your readers should know when things need to be italics, which I hate. I love italics. Keep giving us the italics. But yeah, caps is where I draw my line and it was really bugging me. It's just a very, in. I know it sounds like a nitpicky thing, but that is such an indicator of very in-your-face narration, which I'm not a very big fan of. The plot also felt very disorganized. The, here's, this is gonna sound like kind of mean, I, I think this was at some point supernatural fan fiction. I don't mean like literally, I don't know if it was literally, I don't think it is because there's like a random adult character in this named Dean, which feels like a weird thing to leave in if it was initially supernatural fan fiction and there's another character named Dean. So it's not like any of the other, it's not like there's also a character named Sam and it was like blatantly supernatural fan fiction. But it is girl gets saved by monster hunting family and joins the monster hunt. Like I've read so many supernatural fan fictions like that. Um, but the problem was, if you're a supernatural fan, the series starts out in a very monster of the week formula. Dean and Sam, there is like overarching monster plots, but they're just like they kill one thing, they have a bro talk kill another thing the next episode, you know, like mo like Scooby-Doo, like Monster of the Week, Scooby-Doo for big kids. But then when you get to later seasons of Supernatural, it tends to be a big overarching plot where every now and then there'll be a filler episode where they do the Monster of the Week thing, but those are filler episodes. The main plot has to do with like one big bad. And this book tries to do both at the same time. So there'll be like the big overarching thing, but in the middle of it, they'll be like, let's pause to go fight some other thing. And it just doesn't work from a plot perspective and it made everything feel very very messy. There are a few like standout scenes that I thought were well done but overall I did not like this. The second best book I read was Dig which really surprised me because it threw me into the first reading slip I've had all year. I didn't read for like I read the first hundred-ish pages of Dig 
Um, and then I just stopped reading for like five days and I couldn't get back into it. And when I got back into it, I was suddenly so invested that I actually went back and reread the beginning of it. Because if there was ever a book that it's better to read in one day, it's this one. Because it's like, it's not very, it's confusing when you start, which is I think why I had to like stop and it threw me, because it's an intimidating book to get back into because most of the characters are called by like a descriptor like there's the shoveler there's how can i help you there's like instead of a name uh which gets confusing but also it you very quickly catch on to the game of the book and things start to make sense and i actually ended up really really loving the unique narration style and the way that all of what's at the beginning seem to be like these random disjointed plot threads kind of start knitting together and you know beforehand exactly what's how they're gonna fit together but still seeing it happen was like very satisfying made me very happy i don't want to say a lot plot wise because like i said this book is very confusing at the beginning and i think it is supposed to be very confusing at the beginning but it part of the plot is about how potatoes are the most important thing ever and they are the meaning of life which was just uh, every time they brought up potatoes, I, I feel like the potatoes, the potatoes are definitely a symbol, but it's more fun to view them as if they're just talking about potatoes. Okay, which means the worst book I read this year so far was Spells Trouble, which I was so, so upset by, because I'll say a lot, I feel like every reader has that one very, very specific niche thing that they're obsessed with. Mine is sapphic witches. I'm not even a witch. I don't know why I love sapphic witches so much. I am just obsessed with them. So when I saw saw this book on that galley and I heard that it was a twin witch story with one of the witches being sapphic I was so ready I like this was all I want out of life and I still really 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 didn't like it this is neither it's by two authors and it's neither of their debuts which was really confusing because it's so exposition-y and poorly paced which to me like normally I'd say like that's an indicative of the fact that this is someone's first published work but it's not so I don't know what happened. Um, the first few chapters are a lot of heavy-handed dialogue where characters are like, remember this important detail that you clearly know and that I don't have to be saying out loud to you because it does choose to do a lot of its exposition through dialogue. I think it honestly should have just done it through narration because I think it would have been better to make the, like, have it feel forced in narration and have your reader roll their eyes a little bit then ruin your character's dialogue here too because from then on I'm like why are you no longer just randomly spouting exposition because that's what we were introduced to the characters um and i based on just the way the plot is set up and also like i said the very heavy-handed way exposition is dealt with it felt middle grade um like younger middle grade so i was thinking oh maybe this just wasn't the book for me maybe this book is for like nine ten year olds you know but it also includes swear words, slurs, and sex scenes. And like, middle grade books can deal with serious topics, but this isn't dealing with serious topics. It just happens to have it in them, which means it would not be getting marketed at middle grade people, nor should it be marketed at middle grade people. Uh, I just don't think it has an audience, which I'll say about a lot of the books I don't like, they don't, I don't know who would read this, ex unless you're already a fan of the authors. Okay, then the best book I read was The Invisible Life of Adi LaRue, which in my opinion does live up to the hype. Um, I'm white, I can't comment on, because I know there's like controversy surrounding the fact that Adi only visits like white moments in history and only talks about it from meeting white historical figures. I, I don't know. I've heard varying things. I really like Read with Cindy's video about it, so I'll link that somewhere. Anyways, I personally love this book so much. It's the kind of book, like, you finish it and, like, your stomach drops and you're, like, kind of shaking and you expect everything around you to also be as shell-shocked as you are because there's no way that something could have just impacted you that much and just to, like, have the rest of the world continue to be the same around you. Like, it's... Uh, I, I, love th I love this book with my whole heart. I was really hesitant about this one because of not just the controversy, but I feel like everyone either loved this or hated this. And as a fan of E. Schwab's previous works, I couldn't really see how her writing style could translate to such an introspective story. And uh, it does very well because she changes her, it's very distinctive from her other works. Like I wouldn't know it was the same author. That's not to say I love her writing style in her other work. I love her writing style here for very different reasons. It's very, very introspective and existential crisis -y. So if you're not down to have an existential crisis right now, I'm always down to have one. Maybe wait a little. Uh, but yeah, this was absolutely stunning and beautiful. And I know everyone's already read it, but if for some reason you haven't, you should.
And that is the end of the video. I'm gonna edit this. Hopefully it gets down to under 30 minutes. I'm sorry if it was more than 30 minutes. What have you read so far this year? What if you liked? What if you disliked? Have you read anything I read? Please let me know. I love to hear from you guys. And I will see you next Tuesday-ish. Bye.